The SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, founded in 1911, is now the only institution of higher learning in the United States dedicated solely to the study of natural resources and the environment. Welcome to this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm your host, Don Torrance. And today we're coming from the hustle and bustle of Marshall Hall on the ESF campus. A lot of very special work going on here. We're going to talk about that in our program today. Uh, and my special guest today is Cheryl Doble sitting here with me. Cheryl is the director of ESF's Center for Community Development Research and also a professor of landscape architecture here. What our subject is today, Cheryl, is something I hadn't heard too much about, but I know you've gotten some good coverage of it so far, and that's the development of the Franciscan Vietnamese Freedom Garden in the downtown Syracuse area on the north side. Can you tell us a little bit about that garden? From what I've read, it sounds as though it's going to be a real spiritual and physical center for that community down there. What was the motivation for creating this garden? The site that the garden is, is going to be located on was formerly a site of two uh, somewhat dilapidated houses on the north side, and several years ago, uh, several groups within the, the community, uh, the Syracuse Neighborhood Initiatives, uh, Home Headquarters, and City of Syracuse Community Development came together um, to take a look at that property and to think about how uh, they, they might be able to do something to improve that site. Uh, together, the houses were purchased, Home Headquarters demolished the properties, um, and then they had a vacant site. What we've been doing um, over the past semester, actually probably been thinking about this now for longer than that, so we've been working with the Franciscan community um, and working with them, the Vietnamese communities, and other neighbors on the north side to look at the development of that property that is now vacant for a freedom garden uh, that will be titled the Franciscan Vietnamese Freedom Garden. Now if we could stop there for a moment, the joining of those two kinds of traditions, the Franciscan and the Vietnamese, mm -hmm. into a freedom garden, can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of that? Well, when, when Home Headquarters and, and the Syracuse Neighborhood Initiative first suggested the removal of the houses and the creation and of this open space. And these houses had quite a nefarious past. They say, did. Right? They, they, they were, were not in good condition. The, there were illegal, there. illegal activities going on. And so this was really a step forward in this community and, and, and a recognition that we can improve this community, that we value this place. This is our neighborhood. This is our home. And we're going to take steps to make it the kind of place that, that we really can be proud of. And so when this occurred, the Franciscan um, Collaborative Ministries um, made the commitment to take on responsibility of ownership of the property. And when they did that, they were really looking to make this vacant land a community space. One of the interesting things that I've come to discover and appreciate about the north side is the diversity of, of people that are settling in that neighborhood who have come to this country as refugees. And one of the large groups that is currently there uh, are the Vietnamese. And so when this idea came forward, um, Friar Phil Kelly of the Franciscans um, came together with the Vietnamese community um, who, who were interested in, in creating a space on the north side that would mark their heritage, their arrival in Syracuse and their presence here as they resettle. Um, and so we've been working with them through this class over this semester to think about what this space could be. How do we how do we mark and how do we tell the story of the Vietnamese? How do we create a space that could be shared by the entire community and that will contribute to the community coming together? So this is a great challenge for you and your landscape architecture students, I would imagine, because you have to learn a lot about those two traditions. And then you have to, with their guidance and cooperation, figure out a way to have this both be a physically mm -hmm. attractive space, but a spiritually meaningful one. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair. And and I think in addition to being to the, to that is to design the the site in a way that it can be used for the variety of activities that they'd like to be able to um, carry out on the site. So they want it to be a 
an area where the neighborhood can go, just come and sit and gather, have a cup of coffee and chat. But, but they also would like it to be a place where they can tell the story of their history and, and, and help people understand the Vietnamese community. And also a place where they can have large community gatherings. So that a place where they can celebrate special events and have large numbers of people come. And this is a challenge, actually, on a very small site to accomplish all of these. Yes, I would imagine, because it's going to take some creative use of the space that you have available to you. Exactly. Yeah. Is this typical of the kinds of things your center does, the Center for Community Design and Research, or is this a bit of an outlier and a new kind of challenge for you? Well, you know, we started the Center for Community Design Research probably back around 2000, and it was a response to the fact that we often get requests from community groups to help them on projects. And we have had a long history here in the college of working with communities on, on service projects. Um, but one of the things that's a challenge with service projects is that they can't usually be accomplished in one semester. It takes more, it takes continued follow-up, it takes time to get the project started, students come, they graduate, and so the, the center was really started so that we'd be able to provide more continuity of service. So we began working with the Franciscans and the Vietnamese early in the fall with meetings about how we would work together. And one of the challenges, and you may hear this from the students, is that they don't speak Vietnamese, and so the workshops have had to be translated. So working through the details of how will we come together, how will we partner with you on this project, what will our role be, what will your role be. Now, on, on the 14th, we will be leaving them with a final design proposal, but that will now require additional work as that project moves forward. And so our center allows us to provide communities year-round assistance on some of these projects and it helps us to actually work with the communities on the design but then also take this forward so that the projects become real, get built and, and are become part of the community. What are the benefits for your students? What's, uh, what are the challenges that they have to overcome and what can they take away from this to bring into their profession? Well, one of the things that, that we've, and one of the reasons why we set up the center is that we want to give students the opportunity to learn how to work with non-designers. We think that it's really important if you're going to be a designer working in communities that, that you develop the skills to present ideas, to ask questions, to respond with answers, to show people the various alternatives that they have, and to then understand what they're hearing and bringing that into, into their design proposals. So that it, it's an opportunity for them to be introduced to participatory ways of participating with community, but also gives them practice in developing communication skills, learning new ways of presenting ideas that can be more easily understood by people that are non-designers. We, we tend to talk to each other here in Marshall Hall, sure. and we all speak a language that's based sure. in design. But when, you the the right, but when you step out in the community, we need to find other ways to share ideas and to learn from them. We really look at this as a partnership between our students and the community. And it's their responsibility in this course to, to orchestrate that, to plan it out, to um, carry it out, and then to, to respond with some design recommendations. Well, it sounds like a terrific experience for everyone. Yeah. It's, been, it's been an exciting one this Cheryl one. Doble, thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Hi, I'm Dave White. I'm at the intersection of Townsend, Pond, and Lodi Streets in the city of Syracuse, the future site of the Franciscan Vietnamese Freedom Garden. I'm here with landscape architecture student Nicole Formoso to talk about what she found when they first visited the site. It is small. The first, the first thing was that it's just so small. And the unique thing about small sites is that you have to be very careful about what you design there because you don't have ample amount of space to be able to, to put in whatever you want. You have to have a lot of research and a lot of development in order to create something that's really useful for the people that want it. And so the first thing was how do we make this site, one, look bigger, um, two, incorporate the amount of people that they were looking for, which is a gathering up to like 100 people at times. Um, and three, how do you mi integrate it better into the site? You can't have it just have the sore thumb type thing with God knows what inside of it. So you really had to be careful because it's such a small space. But a lot of the ideas focused on terracing and making 
flat spaces where people could gather and then around that have you know, luscious vegetation that maybe hinted at vegetation from Vietnam or, or incorporated some sort by either textures or colors or, um, that they were familiar with. There's um, a flat terrace that comes out and it's, it's a little rounded up in the top. They can hold around 75 people. And then on that side against that wall and this side here, there's a series of vegetated, almost like hedgerows. They're, they're tight rows of, of different kind of plants. And then here there's a small entranceway from Lodi Street and there's a couple trees that come around and there's other, other proposal out to do garden space within this, this apartment building, this apartment complex here, so that it looks like it's one connected space and it's not just the street you know, closing it off. Um, and I think right now the plan is to keep these three street trees Develop, depending on how the development goes, it might change. We unveiled it to the Vietnamese community and the, their advisory board, um, and they seem to really like it. And so with that now behind us, we can move towards cost estimates and construction documents and, and a phasing plan to see you know, what can happen first and the funds that are raised right now, what can those funds be put in use for? And then after that, the big deal is going to be fundraising. Because right now there is, there is some money uh, for, the, for this development right now, but projects like this usually take a lot of money. This was something that really had to be taken seriously um, because we knew that it was going to affect this community. And I think that's the first time as far as my design career at school had it, it really been realized and, and I really had focused on a real life scenario that this is actually going to break ground and this is actually going to go through. So it was, it was a big deal to us. Yeah, but that, that only made us more and more excited and, and got the energy flowing for those long design nights. And when we come back, we're going to talk with some of the students who have been involved and are involved in the creation of this new garden. Stay with us. You can improve your world by what you plant in your yard. It is commonly believed that invasive species arrived in the U.S. accidentally. Not so, according to a study by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. They found that half of the worst invasive plant species were brought here intentionally for horticultural use. Gardening with native species is an effective way to deal with this problem. ESF's Improve Your World website has helped to find the right trees and plants. You can improve your world by learning more about it. From black bears in the Adirondacks to the restoration of Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario and its tributaries and the growing number of coyotes all across the state, SUNY ESF offers details in its environmental information series. Do we need to encourage growth or curtail it? Get the facts, then you decide. There's also advice for developing environmentally sensitive landscapes, how to test your soil pH and what it means. And welcome back to Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm here now with two landscape architecture students who have been working on the Freedom Garden, Derek Bryant and Heather Washburn. Thanks for joining us. I know you've been working hard on this. It seems like a terrific project, and we actually have one of the early manifestations of some of your ideas here. I'd love it if you could sort of walk us through what it is, the thinking and the planning that's gone into this, and how you've integrated the thoughts and feelings and the desires of our Vietnamese community into this design. Okay, um, so through two workshops, we came up with um, design guidelines that we were using to come up with this final design. And so the community wanted a large gathering space so they can come back for celebrations and work as a community. And so um, a large gathering space was something that they wanted, which we took off of North Townsend Street and brought it into this semicircle on the in the park so they can close off North Townsend and have this large space and then have room for garden areas around the gathering space. And this is, as we mentioned earlier, on the north side of Syracuse, an older, more established neighborhood. This looks like it really provides some opportunities for you because it's not a traditional square block. It's almost like a peninsula here on the north side. What kinds of challenges or opportunities, Heather, did that open up for you? Well, it has great visibility and access because it kind of comes to a more of a point so people coming up 
Lodi Street or North Townsend Street of Salina is just one block over there. It provides a great visibility and um, more access points to the garden itself. And there is a bit of a natural grade to this site. How did that help you or what kinds of challenges did that pose? Um, well, <clears throat> working with the grade and the small site actually posed a lot of difficulty in finding a shape that could work with this small site and the grade and so we came up with the circle coming off of North Townsend which gives almost as much space square footage of paved area as it would if we did a more geometric shape which was kind of causing a lot of problems with angles and stuff that we didn't really like and then it also provided for the handicapped accessibility to come through the site and look like a natural path and not have walls and be imposing on the landscape. No barriers of any kind. Yeah. Now there is a significance to every element of this, I know. Uh, could you start by telling us about these arbors, these overhead arbors, and what their importance is? Well, one thing that they wanted the garden to express was the Vietnamese story uh -huh. uh, from Vietnam to here and their set relocation and settlement here. Um, so we're trying, we tried to find elements that would be found in the natural Vietnamese landscape as far as plant material and arbors are often found in Vietnamese gardens and through the workshops we, uh, we confirmed that by their expression of interest in them. And they provide a sense of security and enclosurement because they ha they're an overhead plane and the placement of them along the sidewalk uh, when it is a smaller gathering, it, it creates a boundary between the semicircle and the sidewalk. Okay. But they're also permeable into the street. Right, easy access and egress. Yes. And how about the retaining wall? Will, what kinds of materials will be that? Will that be made of? And is there any significance in particular to that? Um, right now, it's, um, we're just kind of getting the geometry and the shapes and the look of the garden and so we haven't really gotten into details okay. yet um, and cost will be a determining factor sure. in that and so um, after this weekend when we have our final workshop with the community we'll go into the further details of finalizing what these materials will be. Now part of what you will integrate into this is as you mentioned earlier the story of the Vietnamese Americans and they are contributing also some ideas for that, and they're represented by some of these smaller pieces that you have. Could you tell us a little bit about what's going into that process? Heather, you can start. Here. Okay, well, we, we wanted to use a variety of ways to tell their story. So through the vegetation, through the arbors, and these little posts will have, was also another idea that we got out of one of our workshops um, just by having some words, maybe symbols, pictures, mm -hmm. and they like that idea. So we'll have posts placed along the natural path acting as a ramp that will help to tell their story. I see. And it is the story of their, their lives in Vietnam and then the transition to their lives in America. Yes. Right. yes. Now I know it's too early to ask you about the plantings in particular, but I would imagine too that that's quite a challenging process given that our climate here and our growing zone here is far different from anything in Southeast Asia. Have you begun at least to think about that yet? Yes, um, a lot of the vegetation will be representative of vegetation that you will find in Vietnam through structure and textures and colors. And also we were thinking that if we provided colors of plants and flowers that represented maybe the colors in the Vietnam flag and um, different aspects of that to let people know that this is the Vietnam uh, Franciscan Freedom Garden. And this is also an opportunity for every one of this community to come and share this and learn about our uh, Vietnamese neighbors and also to enjoy the space just simply for the beauty that will be there, correct? Yes. yes. Must have been quite an experience for you folks too to have this as you're both fifth year seniors. Must be something wonderful to put on your resume as you go out into the professional world. This is quite an accomplishment. It is, and it's been a great experience, too, working with people that don't speak English, learning to work with a translator, and just having the opportunity to go out into a real community while we're still in school and, you know, really get the feeling of how our work will, will affect communities like this. Well, we congratulate you. It looks like terrific work, and thanks for joining us and tell us all about it. 
Uh, we're going to talk to some more students who have been involved in the design and execution of the Freedom Garden. Stick with us. We'll be right back. by what you plant in your yard. It is commonly believed that invasive species arrived in the U.S. accidentally. Not so, according to a study by the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. They found that half of the worst invasive plant species were brought here intentionally for horticultural use. Gardening with native species is an effective way to deal with this problem. ESF's Improve Your World website has helped to find the right trees and plants. You can improve your world by learning more about it. From black bears in the Adirondacks to the restoration of Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario and its tributaries, and the growing number of coyotes all across the state, SUNY ESF offers details in its environmental information series. Do we need to encourage growth or curtail it? Get the facts, then you decide. There's also advice for developing environmentally sensitive landscapes, how to test your soil pH, and what it means. We're back here to prove your world at SUNY ESF in Marshall Hall, and we have with us two students now who have been intimately involved with the development and the design of the Freedom Garden. Uh, to my extreme right is Dana Weiss. Dana, thanks for joining us, and Zach Crawford. We uh, appreciate your joining us here today to talk about this. This sounds like it was quite an ambitious project, both for the community and also for you. Dana, what's been your role so far, and what have you taken from this process of collaborating with a real community and then designing something that's going to be very special for them. Well, I think we really acted as sort of a bouncing board for information and also to collect ideas because this is a community that we don't really know a lot about because it's an immigrant community. They have a very different background than us and also the space is particularly special as it used to have um, re rather negative connotations to go with it. So I think that what we've done is really begin to co collect information and then um, using our expertise as landscape architecture students at least, we began to put that into something um, that was different designs to bring back to them. So I think we really just acted as sort of a conduit for information, I would say. Zach, can you give us an example of the kinds of things that you can manifest for this community that has real meaning for them, both physically and, and spiritually, because this is a spiritual center for that community, too. Yeah. Plants, positioning of plantings and different elements, what, what, are, what have you learned is important here? Oh, well, we took, we, uh, through a series of activities, we ended up finding out their interpretation of peace or freedom and a garden, and then we tried to come up there are seven of us, so we came up with different ideas to express those, uh, those meanings. Mm -hmm. It has to be quite a challenge because, uh, for, among other things, you have to select plantings that certainly don't represent things that you would find in Southeast Asia here in Syracuse. So how do you overcome even practical problems like that? Uh, through symbolism. Mm -hmm. You can use symbolism um, through different structures and construction techniques and just representing different things. You don't have to necessarily uh, represent it through plantings. So like overhead plane, possibly like terrace work, um, arbors, like wood um, structures, use of stone, different carvings, things like, like there's uh, and also interpretive. Um, Sounds like you learned thing. a lot while well, Yeah, it was a great learning experience, school. especially working with uh, non English speaking mm -hmm. uh, makes it more of a challenge. Neighborhood, like our um, right. culture. Mm -hmm. So, the, through the use of graphics, we were able to communicate with them and then also with the tran help of translators. Uh, it was a great experience. Now, Dana, you actually had to make a series of proposals, and then from among those, the community chose which ones you could go ahead with? Well, we didn't present them particularly as individual proposals in which they chose one. There were seven of us, so we each did do our own design. But instead of bringing them back to them saying that this is, these are seven, we want you to pick one, we had them look at each one 
in terms of different things I liked about them. So for instance, overhead plane or vegetation, um, the way that we represented the idea of freedom or peace. Um, and so from there, they kind of evaluated it on those terms. And then we took the information that we've gathered about each individual model and decided that they preferred vegetation used in this way, instead of saying they preferred the way Zach or Dana's model looked. Um, that way, we could then come up with one design when we were done that had um, kind of the best of all of them, instead of having them say, well, we like that one best. Now, why didn't you bring it back? So. So it will be true, a true amalgam of all your design ideas, and are the best of the, your ideas anyway. Mm -hmm. So what phase are we in now, Zach? Have they decided on uh, the design elements that they want to be included in this the community? Uh, well, right now, uh, two other of our students are working on uh, Derek and Heather. They're working to come up with the final design and that they can um, take to a landscape architecture company that's also working in collaboration on this project and be able to give that, like hand that design over to them so that they can go further with the project. Well, it sounds like an exciting project. It will be open to the general public, obviously, and it, it's a space that I'd like to see when, when it's all executed. One other thing you're working on that sounds even more ambitious to me is a master plan for the entire ESF campus, and we're kind of surrounded by a lot of the design ideas that a lot of you have had here. Can you give us kind of an overview of that, Dana? What's the process there, and where are you now in that design? Well, a master plan in general um, really just refers to um, a graphic element or a graphic uh, document that gives us general guidelines as to where um, where we're going with the space. So we have the ES with ESF, we know it's growing, we know that there are a lot of changes happening on ESF, and we know that there are some buildings and some structures and just some areas that are outdated or in need of repair. So instead of just moving ahead in individual waves, doing kind of a band-aid approach is what they call it, um, we're instead going to look at this in a comprehensive way, in a way that so that there will be flow between spaces, there will be connections made, and it will be um, really viewed as a single space instead of chunks and pieces that may have awkward um, relationships with each other. You can leave quite a mark, it sounds like, for a class leaving a campus. Yeah, it's going to be, it's, I'm really excited about this. This is another great opportunity just because um, we really want to strengthen who we are and how we express like who we are and broaden our connections into the community like just uh, like in, through innovative practices also like this is our opportunity to shed some light on different uh, th practices that are out there that and like this new technology and different ways of going about like solar panels and different alternative energy uses and actually displaying it and showing it and maybe presenting it to the public right. sounds like quite a legacy Thank you very much for joining us, both of you, and good luck to you. I know you're both graduating soon, and we wish you the best of luck in your career. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our program for today. We hope you've enjoyed it, and you'll get the chance to check out these wonderful spaces that the students in the school here have been designing. Thanks for joining us on Improve Your World. I'm your host, Don Torrance, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>